day that the Lord has made and we have a lot to rejoice about and I am so glad we are together with our church family and able to rejoice um, prayers for the people who aren't able to be here who maybe still don't have power or maybe are flooded um, prayers for all those people but what a blessing we had no clue when we opened today that there would be so many people who were able to get here that it's wonderful Okay, um, one announcement that Colors of Hunger dinner that was supposed to be tonight obviously is not tonight. You either have a ticket or you paid for a ticket. There was an email that went out. If you didn't get the email, relax, it's all good. Your ticket's still going to be good. It's still going to happen, but not today, and you will be notified. Um, and if you haven't gotten anything and you want to talk to Barbara, Barbara's here today. Um, other thing, when we do the offering, these little cards are in your pew. If you have a prayer request, and probably everybody in here has a prayer request, please print it so it's legible and we can be sure that we're praying for the right thing and drop it into the offering. Um, at the end of every pew is a uh, uh -huh, it just fell apart. visitor's welcome pad. Um, and that's for all of us. And the cool thing about this is that if you don't know the person next to you or this is your first time here, if you fill this out, then when you shoot it back down the pew, everybody can read it. It's okay. You're not reading anything private and you know each other's <laughs> names already. Uh, so, you know, when you pass it down, sign in, pass it back, take a look at it and see who you're sitting by. If you're a first-time visitor, we welcome you so much. If you're a member, we're thrilled that you could be with us today. Okay, I think that's it.
sorry, I think we need this to record. Um, let's do the call to worship. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Give thanks to the Lord. Praise his name. Tell the whole world what he has done. His mighty acts on our behalf. Sing to the Lord, for he has done wonderful things for us. Raise your hearts and voices. Shout and sing your praise. For great is the Holy One who lives among us. Let us worship God. Let us worship God. And if you'll remain standing for the hymn. Let us share our confession of our faith with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting.
used to being loud all on my own. Our scripture reading today comes from Matthew 25, a section of parables. This one is the sheep and the goats. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from his goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Let us turn to God for a moment of silent prayer. Well, good morning. good morning. So there was some debate as to whether or not we would have church today because of the weather. And there's a lot of our folks who still can't get out of their neighborhoods. We certainly want to keep them in our prayers. Uh, some of you were some of those people, but somehow you managed to uh, wade through. I didn't notice anybody with wet shoes, so I guess <laughs> you did okay. But uh, we certainly want to keep all of our members uh, that were impacted so negatively by this in our prayers, as well as everyone else in our community. How many of you had water damage of some sort? Yeah? Yeah, well, God bless you. I'm, I'm glad that you're here today. And we we'll certainly will lift that up in prayers in just a little while. Um, but today we're going to talk about one of the great parables, which I uh, had actually planned some time ago, and then it seemed more relevant as we got through, uh, get to and through the storm. You know, I've, I've lived in Florida off and on my whole life, born and raised here. I've been through more hurricanes than I can count. I think, I can count actually. I think it's uh, like six or seven of them where we either, either went right over me or close enough to count. And uh, this was an unusual one, wasn't it? Yeah. So uh, thank God, we, you know, we, it wasn't worse. That's, that, that shouldn't be the first thing out of our mouths, though, is could have been worse. You know? <laughs> could have been, how bad is that when it just could have been worse is the thing. And yet it's still, uh, this is a day to celebrate. It's also Tim Murphy's birthday. Yeah. Ready? Let's do it now instead of later. I, I can't give a good note, but we'll start. Happy birthday. There 
is a story told of an American soldier. He was traveling uh, through Sweden, and he was on a bus, and uh, there was a man sitting next to him, and with a great deal of American pride, he turned to him and he said, you know, the United States is the most democratic country in the world. Ordinary citizens can get onto a bus and ride to the White House, and they can see the president, and they can discuss things with him. And the man said, well, that's, that's very interesting, but really it's nothing because in Sweden, the king and the people travel on the same bus. <laughs> yeah, it's okay, but when the man got off at the next stop, the American was sitting there quietly when other passengers said, do you know who that was? He said, no. He said, that was King Gustav Adolf VI, <laughs> the, the king of Sweden. Yeah. Now, how many times have we heard people talk about the sheep and the goats? I mean, once, twice, a dozen times. It, I think for most of us, at least those of us who have been around the church for any length of time, we've heard it several times uh, over and over again. We've become quite familiar with it. The parable is certainly a Presbyterian story. It's a favorite, but is by no means confined to the popularity of our small group of the family of God. It is one of the key passages that underlies what modern theologians call the social gospel. Keep that in your mind for just a second. It was a foundational work for the ancient monastic orders and indeed for the new monastic orders. For instance, the missionaries of charity who were founded by Mother Teresa. In fact, the parable of the sheep and the goats is probably one of the most quoted parables of all Christendom right up there with the parable of the prodigal son. All the nations gathered before the judge, before the throne of the Son of Man, before the king, and the king uh, separates them, the right from the left, the sheep from the goats, and he judges them. And those on the right are saved and those on the left are condemned. The judgment is made on the basis of their compassion, on the basis of their love, or the lack of it, that is shown by those who gathered before the throne of judgment. Now, I want you to be very clear about this, because it is a part of Scripture that gets misunderstood. Who is doing the judging? Don't say Jesus. Who is doing the judging? Don't say God. They are gathered there because they have judged themselves. That's to what the rest of the, of the parable is about, is you make those decisions yourself. Don't wait to the end and find out if whether or not you were, quote, good enough or bad enough, because every decision you make shapes your eternity, not just in the future, but tomorrow as well. So this place where they are sent, this, uh, this hell, this, this uh, sheol, there's lots of words for it. Yeah, you know where that is, right? That's where God is not. Simply, that's the best understanding that we have of it. Oh, you can try to do the whole flame things and the pitchforks and all, but be aware that didn't come into Christendom until Dante's Inferno. So it was a little late coming for it. When Jesus talks about where do you go when you are far from God, he tried to find the worst place he could think of to tell him. I wish he hadn't done that. I wish he just said, it's wherever I am not. That's where hell is. And you make your choices to either be there or not. If we can get that into our heads, then the silliness of Flip Wilson, who said, the devil made me do it, makes absolutely no sense because you did it. I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. The Son of Man tells those on his right. And to those on his left, he says the exact opposite. I was naked, he tells them, and you did not give me clothing. I was sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. These are awesome words, words of great clarity, words with a wonderful, powerful message for those of us who have ears to hear it. And yet, despite our knowledge of the story and its meaning, the message about the vital importance of being aware of our acts of mercy and sharing and caring with those especially who are different from the rest of us, those who are poor and hungry and in prison, despite our knowledge of this parable, there are elements to it that we're not often talked about or talked about of which we would gloss over it. I mean, I speak, of course, 
of the surprise. I mean, did you catch that surprise? When the sheep and the goats, when they hear the Son of Man say, I was hungry and you did, you did not feed me. I was thirsty and you gave, did not give me drink. And for those who did give it, and, and, and why? Why are they surprised? What is it that both of the sheep and the goats seem to be missing when they perform their good works or when they fail to? I think they are missing a sense of the sacred that penetrates everything in our lives, that is interwoven into the ordinary, indeed the less than ordinary activities and places and people in our lives. Remember the words that Jesus said. He doesn't talk about how blessed are we when we visit our friends who are sick or how wonderful it is when we give good things to our family members and our fellow believers, or how nice it was when we clothe the folk who are just like us. No, Jesus talks about the least among us, the least within this world, those whom conventional wisdom might even regard as cursed, like the poor of Calcutta, the thirsty in the Sudan, the sick in wards and on the desert and jungle floors, those who have uh, AIDS. Jesus talks about those who are in prison, perhaps sex offenders, perhaps murderers, perhaps only those who have stolen so that their families may eat. We don't know. He's not very specific, but we do know that they are the least among us. Those persons who we think really don't count those persons whose opinions we might regard as unimportant or invalid because oh, of their age or their gender, those people whose cries we might ignore because of their race or their economic position in our community, and that the Son of Man, that Jesus the Christ, claims to be among them, indeed in them. And that is surprising, isn't it? at least to most of us. In fact, it might even be considered outrageous, even shocking. And I've said it before, and you've heard me say it, and I'll say it again here. I've said it every church I've ever pastored. When Jesus comes back, you know which church he's going to, right? Not this one. Yeah, not here. Not the one up the street. Not the Methodist church, certainly. Not the Methodist church. <laughs> I'm joking because he won't go to any of those places. He'll be down where the people are poor. He'll be down where the people are hungry. He'll be down where the people are ignored by those who are considering themselves above all of that. And Jesus will be there because you know why we know this? Because that's where he went the first time. It didn't change. He went to those that were rejected by the religious people. Those had been left out by the religious people. No, he came to the religious people but what did they, what did we do? We rejected him. So will it be any different the next time when Jesus walks through the door of this church looking like somebody that you do not want to invite to your house for dinner? Yeah, think about it for just a moment. Because it raises the question of who, which are we going to be, sheep or goats? There's only the surprise that this exalted one this Christ, Jesus himself, has been present in every person they had ever met, and most especially in those who were needy, those who were the least important, the ones that Jesus caused, called the least. And that judgment is based on whether we treat this king, the son of man, present in these the least, though, or well, ignore him and his suffering and his want and his needs. That is to say, the least, a bit disconcerting, because the choice will be ours. We sometimes think that religion is about believing stuff, and that if we just believe the right stuff, we'll be okay. I'm not going to say that that's not true. It's good to believe the right things, but that's not the point, is it? Rather, our faith seems to be about awareness, about having our eyes open to the world around us, and responding compassionately to it, whether we are aware that Christ is there or not. When William Temple, the Archbishop of Canterbury, was an undergraduate, he went to hear a well-known American evangelist preach about God's forgiveness of sin. 
The preacher used the text, Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. And Temple said, Well, though I went to the meeting in a, a serious inquiring spirit, I found myself quite unmoved. Alas, my sins were not scarlet. They were gray, all gray. They were not dramatic sets or acts of rebellion and violent self-affirmation, but the colorless, tired sins of omission, inertia, and timidity. And he's right, isn't he? Because it's the little things that trip us up. Things like being selfish, things like being thoughtless, things like taking one another for granted and not listening and doing similar small but hurtful things to people all around us. The parable, however, is calling us to see Christ, to see the Son of God in squalling children who are getting in our way. It is alerting us to the importance of compassion and to the fact that the Son of Man is present in those around us. To encounter the least of the brothers and sisters of the Son of Man, however, we don't need to go to Calcutta. We can just go up the street right here in New Smyrna Beach. People that will cross your path today who might be hurting in a way that you're not aware. I mean, one of the things that drives uh, my family nuts, right, is that I talk to everybody. <laughs> Am I right? Yes. Yeah, everybody. In fact, I do most of my uh, pastoral counseling um, at Publix. <laughs> yeah. They're, one of the guys that works back in the... Yeah, Bill, we're there all the time, aren't we? One of the guys that used to work in the fish department, he's in um, the meat department. Now, we meet every week and talk about our physical condition. He had a heart-lung uh, issue that uh, kept him at Mayo for about a year. And I asked him one time, I said, you, you, know, um, you know I'm a pastor, right? And he said, yeah, I don't care. <laughs> And somehow that was really refreshing because <laughs> it, made the, it made the playing field kind of level. And uh, ever since then, we've chatted and talked about, you know, some of the things that he's gone through, and it has been really uh, horrific. But where would you, you be if he said hello to you? I mean, would you just say, give me a, more pork chops or something? By the way, I've never gotten any special deals on pork chops, but... <laughs> But you remember that as you go about your activities, that you're crossing paths with people all the time. And they could be hurting. They could be needy. That you don't know. And the worst thing that you can do is be apathetic and just not care. I've been to church today. I've done my thing. Now let's, uh, let's get the french fries on the table. It's time to move on. Remember the first and the greatest commandment the one about how we are to love God with all our hearts and all of our soul and all of our strength and all of our mind. Consider what John the Apostle, the disciple of Christ, says about the love of, in his first letter. He writes this chapter 3, verse 17. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? And again, in the fourth chapter at verse 20 and 21, Anyone who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And he has given us this command, who, whoever loves God must also love his brother. The sheep, those on the right, have shown love for their brothers and sisters, and in doing so, they have shown love to God. And so they enter into this peaceful, paradise place. Not someday, but now. Do you know the joy it is to be engaged in the lives of people? Or do you wall yourself off from those people and make yourself in hell? Because that's what it is. Because there's no God in that. No God present. But for these sheep, their faith is alive. Even if they've not grasped how full it is, even if they have not recognized how the Son of Man is everywhere around them. One might say that the law has been written on their hearts and guiding their actions and their thoughts and their words. But think of it this way. Think of the fullness of it. 
our eyes open to the depth of the real world and not the shallow world of conventional wisdom, then we should see God present in everyone and everything, especially in the needy and those who are least important. And that would be even more transforming, not only to the sheep, but those, for those who are doing good and for those to whom are showing the compassion of God, but also for the goats, for those who may ha have the right creed and the right doctrine, the right beliefs, but who have been judged the least among us and not deserve, those at least among us not deserving of love and care, not people in whom the Holy Spirit dwells. What a priceless thing if the sheep are not surprised by the presence of God in everyone and enjoy remind those who may risk being judged as goats that all people, all people are wonderful, wonderfully made and all in need to be, of being treated as we would treat the Son of Man. It's a provocative thought. It raises a thousand questions like how far should we go in our caring? Who should we care for and who, if any, should we not care for? Because there are some folks like that. How can we prioritize our caring so that the truly needy get what they need while those who would suck us dry do not? Or should we even worry about that? And you know, I can't answer those questions for you. In the 40 years of ministry that I've been uh, uh, working on all this time, we've never found the perfect balance. It's hard. It is very hard. It's something that each of us needs to struggle with one-on-one, -on -one, case by case, day by day. But I can tell you that Christ is all around us, that Christ is in the least among us. Christ is in the single welfare mothers, in those suffering from diseases, in the prisoners in our jails, the homeless on our streets. Jenny Grush of Farmington Hills, Michigan, told about being in a crowded church in Bolivia where she had been traveling. She was a Peace Corps volunteer, and the place was absolutely jammed. But at one point in the service, she was overcome by the heat, and she passed out. And the next thing she knew, she woke up, and she was being passed over the heads of the people, the congregants, until she could get to the door where there was fresh air, and the members of the congregation fussed over her. Sometimes when people take a tumble, they think there's no place for them to turn. Nobody who cares. This parable is telling us that we are that place, that we are those people. So where is Christ to be found today? Where is the Son of Man? Because he is most certainly here, here in this holy place, in you, my brothers and sisters, but he's also here in ways that we will not so easily grasp. I understand the surprise of those sheep on the right of the Son of Man and of the goats on the left. I understand the surprise. I understand because it's so easy to not see him in those who are reckoned to be least among us. I understand it, but I find it sad. Sad not because doing good to the least among us has no effect when we are unaware Clearly, it does have an effect, an effect for those who receive acts of kindness and an effect for us who perform those acts. But sad because seeing Christ in those around us is so enriching and so helpful as we walk the walk that he calls us to walk. But sad because seeing the sacred in everything is so transforming for us and for the world. If only we would open our eyes and see it. So let's pray for that. We thank, O oh God, of all the places where we can find your son Jesus and hear him calling to us. We think of how he is present in the lives of those who are sick, and how we can see him in the face of strangers who come into our town and our nation. We think of how he longs for us to visit him in prison and cries out to be fed and clothed and given shelter from his place in the cities of this nation. Help us to be more aware, more loving, more compassionate. Make us more aware of how Jesus Christ is to be found within the least of our brothers and sisters, of how he speaks to us in those we consider unimportant or less righteous or less deserving 
than we or those whom we favor are. Keep them and keep us from the sin of blindness. But failing that, O oh God, grant to us the very least a compassionate heart. We make these prayers, all of these things, through Jesus Christ our Lord, our brother, the one we serve with all of our love. Amen. Let us give to God now our tithes and our offerings.
Notice that we skipped over communion, right? Yeah. That's because uh, several of the people that are involved in getting that prepared and serving it couldn't be here today. And so uh, after the storm passed, they said, do you think we could postpone it? I said, of course. So next week, right? Next week will be uh, uh, worldwide communion here in New Smyrna Beach. <laughs> so <laughs> worldwide. But uh, we, we, th we thank the folks that uh, work so hard to get everything ready for um, s the service today, and many of whom could not be here uh, to actually worship with us. So we had folks um, who were here. Um, it's, uh, practically, the last drop of rain fell, and they were in the parking lot getting a tree out of it and moving stuff. Yeah, give them. I want to uh, lift up Jeremy Toth and Travis Freeman, who were 
uh, volunteers with this in particular uh, because their moms will be very proud. And, um, but everyone else that was here too, uh, we had uh, Newman's crewman here uh, and other volunteers. And so thank you all very, very much uh, for being out there. Who was the person with the wheelbarrow? This one. I heard about you out there. Can't lift stuff as much, but boy, you are hell on wheels with it. <laughs> vroom, vroom, everywhere. So thank you very much. Yeah, that is, that's a, that's a great skill. Um, Jenny Chow is uh, uh, out of her home because of flooding, and she is uh, staying with the Stookies right now. So please keep all of them in your prayers and for some solution for uh, Jenny long term. Uh, but uh, she has uh, both her and her dog uh, need some prayers for where she, her, her per permanent place will be while everything's being rebuilt. Um, Sally Altobello also. Uh, had uh, flooding, and uh, we heard that Dallas Whiteacre might have, but we're not really sure about that. And Audrey, I heard that you had some, but was I wrong about that? Not in the house. Okay. Ooh. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, her, so Dallas's house is a destruction zone. Gone. Kathy. Oh, goodness gracious. All right, Kathy, we'll keep you in our prayers as you find uh, solutions for that. Ugh, that is, who, who would have thought? Who would have thought that we would have had this much uh, destruction from that storm? Um, but there are some others that are. Uh, I'm going to ask you to lift up in prayers. One is, uh, and this one's from Jenny Chow. Uh, this is for my very dear friends, Bob and Connie Keller, who have been um, evacuated. evacuated from Pine Island. Yeah, Pine Island, I don't think it's still there anymore, is it? Yeah. yeah, it's down in Port Charlotte in that area, and will not be able to return to their home for six to nine months. Yeah. Uh, Lee County, Florida, uh, Cape Coral, and Fort Myers area, uh, all affected by the hurricane. Uh, many of you may not know that uh, Deborah's family were actually the founding family for Fort Myers. I mean, I don't mean like that's a family story, actually recognized by the governor, the founding folks. So get busy and go over there and <laughs> clean it up. But uh, no, it's a tremendous destruction there. Uh, oh, but this is a prayer of thanksgiving. Um, this is from um, Barbara. Barbara Singh. I can't tell. Anyway, oh, Barbara King. Good to see you, Barb. You feeling okay? Yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad you could, uh, one day at a time. I'm glad you could be here with Charlie, though, because he gets, he gets crazy, you know. <laughs> you never know. He'll run up here and start playing the organ, and, uh, but we have kept you in our prayers through the, <laughs> good, let's see. And uh, I am back to church, and feeling better, that's good. And this is uh, Kim Long, uh, for, for prayers for her, her father passed away. And uh, Kim, I don't think could be here because of the flooding. She's in the villages. She's in the villages, yeah. Villages got it, big time. Whom else can we lift up in prayers, those that you're aware of? Just say it really loud, Mary Martin. Mary Martin, her family, no power, and she's ill. Well, um, I'd like to lift up many of you who prayed for her before. Um, Dallas is starting to do really bad. And the volunteer people might be thinking about the prayers that may be a little slack in the step. Who? She's not doing well. Okay. We keep that in our prayers. Yeah. Um, I can lift up Paul's family who's been here. We have Carla. Goodness. Paul has to be down here. No, no. I saw um, Joy West yesterday, Joy and Fred. Uh, she's in the hospital over here uh, with some issues that uh, they're still trying to figure out what's going on with her. But uh, she could talk and interact and everything, which is good. Fred's really tired, but uh, he's spending as much time up there as he can. In the back.
Lynn Link. We'll keep her in our prayers for flooding. Marilyn? Thank you for telling us about that. That's where did they live? Chamber Trace. Chamber Trace. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Gene and Jerry probably had flooding too, right? Yeah. Oh, Audrey's grandson, 22, in the hospital with heart issues. And pneumonia. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm speaking as the head of the deacons, I want to uh, thank you, really, for all that the deacons have been doing, keeping track, keeping up with. Uh, our shut-ins and the folks in our congregation. So thank you very much, Linda. Appreciate that. All the work the deacons are doing. Yes. Certainly. All right, with that in prayer, let us go to God. Sometimes, oh God, we seek your presence in prayer, but the words just don't come easily. We want to be open to your spirit, but the knowledge of our own weakness makes us close down and pull back from your love and from the love of those around us. When we feel frightened, alone, confused, and frustrated with our own feeble efforts, it is your spirit that intercedes with sighs too deep for words. We can let go in trust and faith that you know our needs and desires even before we can put them into words. We can rest in your presence knowing that you are involved in our daily lives, working to bring that which is good and true. We rededicate ourselves this morning to your purpose, knowing in faith that you are working for the good in all circumstances. We lift our concerns and prayers to you. We lift prayers for our world and its leaders that justice, peace, and righteousness may prevail over those forces that would degrade or dehumanize. We ask your spe special presence be with those who suffer loss because of the storms. May we see your face in the compassionate strangers who reach out with a helping hand. Be with those who face illness, both physical and mental, that they might be restored, refreshed, and renewed by your grace. Bring comfort to those who await test results that may or may not be life-changing. We pray that your presence is so powerful that those people feel lifted up and held close to your heart. Humble us, loving God, that we might be receptive to the gift of your unfailing grace. Forgive us when we act as if we have all the answers. Forgive us for the times we manipulate or use others. Forgive us when we exploit situations for our own benefit. Forgive us when we pursue our own personal needs at the expense of others. We thank you for the abundant love and grace that you make available to us in spite of our weaknesses and shortcomings. We thank you for the gift of your son and for the assurance that nothing can separate us from your love. Your spirit reaches out to us in our moments of weakness and give us strength and power beyond our understanding. For this we give thanks. And we lift up our voices together in prayer using the words that you gave us to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand. Well, I'm so glad we chose to be together today. I know that for some of you it was a real challenge to get out of your neighborhood, and I just pray everything dries up as quickly as possible. I mean, we live on Beachside. I would have thought that everything had been gone, and yet we had really nothing. It was, uh, it was really surprising that Wawa, of all places, got blasted so badly. Anyway, we have great people working in our communities, and let's lift all of them up in prayer to keep them safe, not just those that are visiting, but our own city and state people as well uh, that are doing the very best that they can So, uh, and working so, so hard. You can see them everywhere. Um, but I'll see you at the back of the door. Let's greet. And uh, there is no fellowship because this is normally Communion Sunday, so we don't do that on Communion Sunday. But next Sunday, we will have Communion whether we have fellowship, Lori will tell me. <laughs> She's saying, yes, we will. Is that right? Awesome. Thank you so much. And now, receive the benediction of our Lord Jesus Christ as, go, as he goes before you and follows after you and leads you along the way until at last we are all safely in his home. Amen. <laughs>